Have you ever performed a magic trick for someone and then right at the end, when it was all over, hoping that you'd receive a well-deserved round of applause. Instead, the spectator looks at your props and says, can I see that? They want to hold your props. They want to inspect your cards. What do you do at that point? Let's talk about it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you guys so much for being here. My name is David and I am a magician with over 40 years worth of experience and I use that experience to create this safe space where we get to talk about magic tricks Monday through Friday. Uh, normally, I review magic tricks, both the latest and the greatest. And so if you don't wanna be fooled by ad copy or snazzily filmed commercials, head on over here to find out exactly what your money gets you. On the weekend, I also review playing cards and I also give away thousands of dollars worth of magic every single year. And so if you like free magic and you like talking about magic, hit me up with a like, subscribe, and a follow. Push those buttons. That really helps me out a lot. Hey, the question, can I see that? It's one of the three that questions. There are three questions the spectators typically ask and they all have the word that in them. And I've already done the other two. Like, can I, see, uh, can I see that is one of them, but how did you do that is another one, right? And so I have answered those questions now and we are on to question three. Can I see that? People want to inspect your props. They want to inspect your cards. They want to expect, expect, inspect your coins. Something about how you did the trick. Now they want to see your props, right? And to be fair, some props are examinable and some aren't, right? It all depends on the trick. A lot of times we do tricks with normal cards or we do tricks with normal coins or rope or sponge balls. And there's nothing inherently gimmicky about any of it. And so in those situations, we're usually fine with letting spectators examine props. Other times, yeah, we use uh, tricky cards or tricky coins or tricky boxes of plastic, right? That we know that if we handed it out, regardless of how well it's built or how well the secret is discovered, some spectators act like a, you know, a jungle animal sitting there pulling and tugging at everything. And you don't want them to break your prop, but you also don't want them to discover the secret. So to say some phrases like, well, not right now, you know, I've, I've, I've seen that or, you know, like, hey, well, you know, maybe later, maybe later. And you, and you put the pop away or just say, you know what? Hey, how about I show you something else? All those kind of dodgy answers kind of just make you look guilty, right? And you, it makes you look like you're hiding something. And so even if you did say in a nice way, maybe later, or you know what? I'd, I'd rather show you something else. I think sometimes the feeling in their thoughts, the spectator is that, oh, well, it must be, it must be a trick prop that they won't let me see it, right? Otherwise he would have said, or she would have said, sure, right? So you didn't say, you didn't say yes. So obviously the trick lies in the gimmick and not the person. So I think one of the first things we should talk about in this question is the types of tricks, right? Some tricks uh, end clean. End and clean means the prop you're left with is normal, right? Examinable. Some tricks end dirty. So you've done some sort of magical element, you've done some sort of magical feat, and then the thing they're now staring at is something you wouldn't want them to examine. So you, this is how you end. You can end clean and you can end dirty. Pip Trip from Doug Kahn is a perfect example of this. When Pip Trip was first created, uh, Doug Kahn's original concept was you would have a gaff card to start with. You have a broken gaff card and all the pips are in one corner. And through the process of the trick, you begin to slide the pips to the, to the four corners using a gaff every single time. And then you end with a clean four of clubs. So you start with something broken and you say, let's fix it. And then by the end, you have a normal four of clubs. The spectator said, hey, can I see that? Sure, here it is, because you ended clean. 
I saw it resold, repackaged, re-released from other creators, and they did the trick the opposite direction. You would take a four of clubs and then do like a matrix effect where you'd slide the pips into the four corners. And then you end with the gaff card. And Doug's argument was, why do you want to end with a gaff card, thus ending dirty? And B, why did you take something good and break it? Why was destruction your magic trick? Whereas he created it as something was already broken, let's fix it, let's restore it, so it has a much more positive take. So you obviously can't let every spectator examine every prop, unless you're the kind of person that only performs with clean props. You say, you know what, I'm a purist, I believe in 100% sleight of hand, so I only use regular everyday items, everything I own is examinable. Fantastic. But even if you have completely normal props, if you had to stop every single time one of your tricks was over and let spectators examine things, you'd never get through your act. So we have to agree, audience management is important. It's, it seems like the default answer, I know. It seems like the tried and true answer that everybody says like, oh, well, audience management. I get it, but there is some truth to it. You don't want to have to stop and start and stop and start through your whole routine. If you, if you have to sit there, especially if you're performing for multiple people, you want to start passing the deck around to everybody so that they can all examine it? Come on, right? You have to establish yourself uh, and the, your type of character at the very beginning. Are you the type of per performer that does audience interaction? You will co are constantly putting things in the spectator's hands anyway. Here's a pencil, sign this, here's a pen, here's some cards. Hey, can you hold that coin? You hold that coin and you give a coin to him. Or are you the kind of performer that just performs? Right? You're putting on a show and the spectators are just watching. You have to establish yourself and your character right at the front so that the audience knows how to act. Are they going to be interactive with you, talk to you, take things from you, or are they just going to sit there and watch and applaud? That's part of your character. That's part of you and how you approach and how you begin. That, that kind of thing has to be thought through. The flip side of that is performing for family and friends who know you right? And I would offer, at least from my own experience, this is just my experience. This is, you know, just me talking here. But I think family and friends are worse. They're worse because they know you. You weren't hired to perform for them. Nine times out of 10, you might even be practicing a trick on them. So at the end, they know that you're just David, right? Their uncle or whatever. And that you're not a magician and you really work as a, you know, uh, a math teacher or <laughs> an electronics engineer. So naturally they're going to think, oh, well, you're not a professional magician, so you must be using some sort of weird prop. Can I see the prop? I find that family and friends are much more um, curious about your props and they want to see them and they want to know how the tricks are done. Whereas if you're hired and paid and walk around and you're there professionally, I mean, obviously there's always the drunk people that are the annoying people or, you know, there's always some of those. But I would think for the most part, when you're a paid professional and you're walking around, you're supposed to be there. People are there to be entertained by you. Those audiences are more respectful of your time Especially if you're like, well, I have to go to that table too to perform. You know, I can't, I can't stop and start. I have to do my show. I think those people are more um, open to just watching you perform and they're less, uh, they're going to be less interested in stopping you and, and asking to see all your props. So let's talk about a couple tips. All right. A couple tips we can do. Let's do six. Let's do six tips that we can do to cut down on the question. Can I see that? So let's cover the first one. All right. How you handle your props matters. How you handle the props matters. Now, I know I said, you know, audience management is important. It is, of course. But I look at it as if you care about the props so much and you're being so gingerly with them or you're just, your body um, tone is just sending off negative or guilty vibes, your audience is going to pick up on that. You know, how you handle a trick deck or a mark deck should be exactly the same as how you handle a normal deck. 
how you hold on to a trick coin should be the same as how you would handle a normal coin. If this coin is only worth a quarter and you treat it like a quarter, well then your $150 trick quarter, you should treat it like a quarter. You know, your $150 book test, you should treat it exactly the same way you would treat a $9.99 fiction book. A guilty magician, in other words, you're performing with, with magician's guilt. A magician guilt, a, 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 a magician performing with guilt is just as bad as a magician who hasn't practiced. I think you telegraph that there's something wrong with this prop, just with your body, okay? So start to figure out how you can get around handling your props. You know, you watch some magicians, they've got trick cards and they just throw them, toss them, scatter them around the table, scoop them all back up, you know, riffle shuffle them, put bends in them, increases in them, make, let people mark them up with pens. When you do that kind of uh, performance, then you start to say like, hey, I don't care about these props. And if you don't care about the props, then they won't either. Second thing I would say is just use common sense. Use common sense. Find places where your props can be examined. If your trick starts clean, let them examine the props at the beginning. Common sense. If your trick ends clean, then let them use their examination prowess at the end. And if you know it ends clean and they say, hey, can I, can I see those cards? Then just say, as soon as I'm done. At, at the very end of this, you know what, just hold on. When I'm all done, I'll let you see the cards, right? If you know it ends clean, just admit it. Just say, hey, as soon as it's done, as soon as I'm finished performing, you know, just let me get through this performance. As soon as it's done, I'll let you see the cards. So if it starts clean, that's a great time to let people look at the deck, right? Here, there you go. You, you know, look at these coins, check it out. Or pretend to borrow a coin from somebody. You know, that's another way that a trick can start clean is if you switch an item out right, for a borrowed item. Advice number three, if your spectators are grabby, that might be a sign that you need to work on the routine more. What does that mean? Well, comedians will often go out and tell one or two jokes as a practice. They won't do a whole set. They'll just say, hey, I need 10 minutes to walk up on stage and try a, uh, try a joke out. And they'll just, you know, perform in between two other uh, comedians just to see how the audience reacts. And if the audience doesn't react quite right, they go back and tweak it and then come back on stage and do that same joke again. Magicians, we have that same opportunity. If you're not getting the results you want, the audience isn't reacting the way you want, don't blame the trick at first. Decide that you're going to fix and retool the routine. And if you've got a trick where you feel like Every time I do this, they want to inspect the card. Every time I do this trick, they want to inspect the deck. Every time I do this, they want to inspect the coins. Then take that trick back and retool it. Figure something else out. Maybe you're doing it exactly like the video. Well, maybe that tutorial doesn't work for you. Maybe you need to tweak it to make it work for you and your environment and your situation and your spectators. Don't be afraid to change tricks. Trick routines are not, you know, holy, you know, <laughs> inerrant forever. <laughs> you, you have everyone's permission to make tricks your own. So please retool them, rework them if you're constantly being asked to examine those props. Another piece of advice, start building routines and stop doing tricks. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're gonna come out and say, hey, you wanna see this thing I'm working on and you just do one trick and stop, well, since nothing's coming next and we don't have an easy way out of this, maybe a spectator might say, oh, that was cool. Can I see the cards? Because you didn't offer them a next thing because you naturally broke the performance. But if you maybe have a new trick that you want to show somebody, maybe put it in between two other tricks that you've already been doing for a while. Chances are you have a trick that would match or pair well with another trick, right? If you're doing a trick with a cowboy deck and you're telling a story about Wild Bill Hickok or Billy the Kid, maybe you have another trick with like an old rusted key or some poker chips that you could do before it. 
build a routine of a couple of tricks, work them together, and then just move seamlessly from one trick to the next, that will cut down on spectators wanting to grab your tricks, especially if you have one of those tricks where you feel like this thing starts and stops dirty. Okay, put it in the middle of two other tricks. Just keep going, right? Don't give your spectator the opportunity to stop you to ask to see your props. So stop doing tricks and start doing routines. Read a book. That's my other piece of advice. Read a book. Uh, the Books of Wonder, Tommy Wonder, he has uh, two volumes. His first volume has a whole uh, section on this very topic. So if you have that book already in your house, uh, pull it out. Or if you've been thinking about getting Tommy Wonder's books, uh, that's something I would recommend. His first book has a whole section about how to keep spectators from wanting to examine your props. And my last piece of advice is learn a deck switch. <laughs> learn a deck switch. If you have a gimmick deck and you don't want them to examine it, then just learn a deck switch. Or do your, you know, your your first act, your first part of your routine is with a Svengali trick, maybe. You've got a Svengali deck, you do a trick, or the invisible deck, right? And then as you put it away, you bring out a coin trick, you make the coin vanish, and you say, you know what? Let me do a card trick, let me do one more card trick for you, and then just bring out a normal deck, right? Even if it's that, even if it's that <laughs> bad of a deck switch, maybe that's what you have to do. But learning to switch out coins, right? Or to switch out decks, is a skill that we should, all should learn. So learn a deck switch. And really at the end of the day, our goal is to entertain. Our goal is to entertain and to instill a sense of wonder in someone. Ultimately, your tricks should be so entertaining that the spectator is just watching you with mouth open and just lost in thought and curiosity. So the whole idea that you're doing a trick to fool them shouldn't even cross their mind. If you're doing your performances well and you understand your character well, they really shouldn't even be thinking about examining dirty props. Oh, he must be using trick cards or she must be using a trick coin. Those thoughts shouldn't even be crossing their mind, right? You should be confident in your performance and they should be confident and feel like they trust you. If they don't trust you, and they're constantly asking to inspect this and inspect that, inspect that, then I would just say, you probably need to practice more. And uh, you probably need to spend some more time working on your routines. Let's, let's get back to entertaining and instilling a sense of wonder in people and creating a space where people are just thrilled to see live magic. Hey, this is the best part of the video because now you get to offer your own advice. So if you thought about something while I was talking and you had a piece of advice or something that you would like to emphasis off something I said, or maybe I said something you totally don't even agree with. You're like, David, I don't agree with you at all. That's fine. That's the great thing about the internet. We can all share those ideas. Put those helpful comments down below for other people to read. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.